Okay, what we wanted to do, and we're doing things on the fly this morning, what we wanted to do is br briefly have some reflections from uh, a, just a, a couple of people who have been intricately involved in, in the Congress. So if those people begin to come forward, uh, I'm going to turn the podium over to my colleague, Don Carter, and I just want to thank once again the facilitation team and delegates that worked late into the night on putting those propositions together. Absolutely. And, and thank you all for your contributions to that dialogue. Um, so that was digital democracy. Um, I want to call attention to Turning Technologies, the company that did this from Youngstown, Ohio, nearby, another post-industrial city. And Jennifer Marcin Marcini, a Carnegie Mellon graduate who's been with us for two days. So thank you for that. I was very anxious about whether this would work or not, but I think we, we really uh, accomplished what we wanted to do. Now for some reflections on the Congress. I'd like uh, three people to come up here and, and sit on these three chairs, Alan Malik, Tony Griffin, and John Thompson. And we're asking them to be spontaneous, as, and, and think of them as your surrogates, as if you were up here and we were, we were just talking. It's not going to be long. It's going to be reflective. They're going to pass the microphone back and forth. So I'm just going to, I'm going to plant a few ideas. You pick whatever you want from them or do whatever you want. So some of the things I was thinking about, what was the highlight of the Congress for you? What will you take away? What was missing? Should there be another convening? So. Alan, we'll start with you, and I, I, those are not the questions you have to answer, but they're just what I'm salting you guys with. So whatever you want to say, you got five <coughs> minutes each, ten minutes, whatever you need. Okay. Well, I was, I was thinking about kind of this 25 years ago, today, 25 years from now, and how this Congress made me reflect on that. And just a couple of thoughts that came to mind. The first one was, I think somebody said this earlier, 25 years ago, there was some question, real doubt, about the future of American cities. Perhaps less so in Europe, but certainly in the United States. And today, I don't think there's any doubt anymore. Cities are being remade. Cities, even cities that were all but given up for loss 25 years ago, are showing significant signs of life and vitality and change. And that's the good news. The bad news, and I think, you know, for all the TED Talk flourishes that we had to look through, some of what Richard Florida said yesterday was extraordinarily important. Because to me, it underlined the danger that we are not only creating a society with vast inequities, but we are institutionalizing those inequities into the very fabric of American society. And that, I think, is part and parcel of the revitalization story. And so those are the two sort of broad themes that have come out of today that I think are critically important. The second point is that if we look 25 years from now, and I'm always you know, skeptical about you know, trying to be a prophet, because when I've tried in the past, I've failed miserably, is my guess is <clears throat> that 25 years from now, the cities we have are going to look very similar to what they look like today. In fact, interestingly, I think one of the most important themes about the remaking process that's gone on in the last 25 years is the extent to which that was not so much a remaking as an unmaking. And that what we were really trying to do was to dismantle the apparatus that had been developed particularly from the 1940s through the 1970s, 1980s of urban renewal and massive displacement and highways and so forth in order to go back to a vision of the city that had existed prior to that and to recognize that that was the right way to think about cities. And I was thinking, you know, I have a, a separate career as an opera scholar and Giuseppe Verdi, the greatest opera composer ever, said very famously years ago, 
you know, torniamo all'antico, sarà un progresso. If we only return to the past, that is progress. And I think we have to bear that in mind, that, the, that we have to, and I thought a lot of the ideas here were very important, that, that we have to recognize the soul of the city, the fabric of the city, and build on that and not violate it. And I think as we go forward, the quest, we have two fundamental questions. Can we continue to build on the historic fabric of the city? And can we somehow change the progressive institutionalization of inequity that seems to be so deeply rooted in the post-industrial society? Thanks, Al. Uh, I did want to say, before we go to the next one, why are these three people up here? Well, Alan and Tony were on our program committee, and, and probably two of the most forceful people on the committee with great ideas. And John and Alan both were here in 1988, and so they have the ability to bridge the 25 years. So who wants to go next? John, go ahead. Um, my reflections are really to do with the difference between being English and being an American. And the admiration for the level and quality of debate that I've heard everywhere, whether it's in the tea break or in the breakout groups on the buses, um, I think there's a level of intelligence and understanding about urbanism here that doesn't exist in, in my country. You may think that's odd because we've got a lot of it, but it's not understood you certainly wouldn't get a debate at this level of intelligence at number 10 Downing Street amongst the ministers that represent their fiefdoms. Um, our minister for communities understands absolutely nothing about community. Um, and our, you know, our, our secretaries of state have chosen uh, for political reasons and shuffled around for nonsensical reasons. Um, I'm delighted that I haven't heard the word architecture used once. <laughs> and I find it in many ways ironic that the AIA has awarded uh, a gong, as we would call it, to the Prince of Wales, uh, because um, there is, uh, there's a pretty tough relationship between the RIBA uh, and, and the Prince's activities uh, in England. So I think that's... Um, that I think will hearten the prince considerably. Um, I think the, the, the challenges and the scale of the, of, of, of the debate that's been held here is all about a country under great change uh, with big problems which are shared between the cities. And I think somehow this level of intelligent debate has to be encapsulated um, it'd be great if, if Corbusier can get on a boat and write a charter, and the Charter of Athens way back in whenever it was. I think we ought to make this event happen at certain moments in time when relevant new thinking is needed about cities. And the thinking about cities that we've talked about most has been thinking about the equality of people and how that is brought about, about where they live, where their jobs are, how they relate to the environment. I think it's an incredibly impressive event to be at. It's the best Congress I've been at, and I've been at a lot. The challenge is how long can we take away the uh, raising of the spirits that we feel when we listen to like-minded people from different places. Um, so I think what to do with remaking cities, uh, the event and the thinking what comes out of it. Uh, in our group, we talked about thinking about a program that could lead to an invitation to cities to come together for the next event. Um, and during that process, to work along the lines that could be a manifesto for the way to work with your people and to bring about more e equality uh, in the decision-making process that could perhaps, this, I mean, the, the, the voting when that's all analyzed there's a pretty common theme about working with people. Um, everybody seems to do charrettes here. 
um, to think about a program for inviting cities to participate and to come back to the next event could be more about um, bringing the results of processes that have been inspired by this Congress um, and that we could all look forward to bringing something of our own experience to the next event. So, um, you know, I'd like to congratulate everybody that's organized this event. Um, there must be a hell of a lot of philanthropy knocking around because I haven't paid anything apart from an aeroplane <laughs> ticket and having a bit of food to eat occasionally. It'd be impossible to do this in Britain. I think there is a spirit of community in America which we probably don't appreciate in England and you probably think we much have, have much stronger communities you know, over the pond. But uh, what I've been hearing about the revival of Pittsburgh uh, and, and, and the commitment that people have to their communities and from industry and um, the partnerships that, that have brought around this renaissance, mostly of downtown cities, um, needs to be booted up again to think about the suburbs, which are much more complicated. They have less leadership, they're less glamorous, uh, they have less reason for being where they are, but all great cities, the core of the city was in the right place because that's the reason for the city to be there. So I think the easy bit's been done um, and we need to collectively think about how the strength of the intelligence of this event can inform uh, a program of similar events that could uh, inspire more civic leadership um, to think about um, the suburbs, the infrastructure, um, the desperate need for public transport, all those sorts of issues and climate warming. Um, so I'm privileged for being here and I look forward to the next event and you better hurry up and make it happen. Okay. Thank you, John. So I was not here 25 years, um, but I'm within the 25th year of my career. Uh, I started as an architect and have morphed into a, an urban designer and urban planner. Um, and I've tended to always work in cities uh, where we've left a lot of land behind, um, but we've also left a lot of people behind. And it's been great that this conference has begun to surface that leave behind. Um, and so I think it's important uh, and as did others in conversations that I've been a part of over the last couple of days, is as we talk about remaking cities, that we ask ourselves the question, what are we remaking cities for? And I think if we take Don's challenge about the fishbowl to heart, I think we also want to ask about who are we making cities for? And so I, I, I'd like to uh, just broaden the conversation a little bit uh, about the use of this term equity, which I feel like in some cases has been used synonymous with inclusion and so forth. And I'd like to suggest that perhaps we change the frame a little bit to talking about urban justice. And that the components of that include issues of equity, but also uh, about equality, which may be more about the practice of how we create equity that we do think about inclusion, and people have talked about inclusion as a process, as well as inclusion as an outcome. That urban justice also talk about access, the ways in which people have access to the benefits of what remaking the city will be about. And that we've talked about diversity too, but I think I'd like to expand that a little bit to talk about uh, more about the acceptance of difference in that if we want all these things that help to frame urban justice and eradicate many of the things we've talked about around about the unjust city that we have to accept difference as a part of that equation and the fabric and the soul of the city and this is everything from how places look to who's in them and as Don said who sits at the table of making the decisions about how we move towards a more just city. And so I think what's been, one of the things that's been great about what we just went through, um, I was really more intrigued by the no opinion ones. Um, because perhaps these are some of the, 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 the uh, provocations that were put forward that were making people uncomfortable and thoughtful and unsure about which way to decide. And I think that's fantastic. I think if people have walked away 
hearing something that they're not quite sure about and they want to be thoughtful about it, that we've perhaps put some new things on the table. I think the provocations that make people uncomfortable and those one percent around things that people felt uh, were so mother of the earth, um, hopefully are making us all think. And, and I like that pushing. And I think we have to push if we're really serious about what it means to create a just city for these post-industrial cities, if you remember, have been living in some of these states for decades, decades. And I, I would hope that in the way in which we did this by integrating technology, that we've now um, put in place a kind of tracking mechanism, if you will, that 25 years from now, we'll be able to think about some measurements of, of where we've come. And I think, you know, as Alan said, uh, physically changing cities takes time, right? I'm sure we're still working on some of the changes that we put forward back in 88. They take time. And so I think this question of who is the city for, if, if we had framed these propositions in um, what if we were uh, doing this for resident advancement as the underlying objective of remaking cities, how are we going to look back and not only see physical change happen, but see the elevation of people's status in the city, position them to have better choices and better access at the Just City. And I hope that somehow in the documentation of this, there's a framing of that challenge uh, uh, that I think is fundamental in a lot of the planning we're doing around the country. It's fundamental in the framing of the center that I've started, which is called Design for the Just City, um, that we put that advancement and that challenge about urban justice very front and center, and then evaluate how these propositions are gonna help us overturn that. Because we're always gonna have to reframe and reform and redesign physical places and physical systems to adapt to the natural organic way in which our cities are always unfinished. Um, but how do we link that as planners? And I think that the, the, the framing of planning and social innovation kind of hit at the intersection of planning for that social advancement. Um, would be great to see, and I think a, a really dis, a clear distinction between 25 years ago and today, and I think help frames up a way with which to look at where we've been 25 years from now, but even how to further that for the next 25 Thank years. Thank you, Tom. Now, um, Alan and, and John, we can go back one more time briefly for all three of you. You might have a second or third thought. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think that another thought that comes to mind and is reflected in a lot of the recommendations, and I'm not, I have no idea how we are going to do this, but is the need, is the idea that a lot of the systems that we have in place today in terms of governance, in terms of institutional systems, in terms of financial systems, so forth, simply are not working very well in terms of trying to get us to the next level of where we want to be in terms of a socially, economically just city, and as well as a region that also works well, in term, whether it's in terms of creating the kinds of infrastructures, in terms of distributing resources more broadly than simply the areas that seem to be currently grabbing the lion's share of resources and all of these things. And I think one of the things that just we should be really thinking about is how do we create the systems? And I think one of the big questions that always comes to my mind in, in these kinds of events where we have these kinds of recommendations, I mean, I think there's some wonderful propositions that have been put forward in terms of change. But I think our task now is to go back and start thinking about how do we if, create that kind of change, create the mechanisms for change. If we need new ways to think about infrastructure or new ways to think about how we account for public resources or how public resources are allocated, how are we going to create that, whether it's at the 
local level, the regional level, or the national level. And in that light, I'd say one of the more dispiriting things that, and this were conversations, a lot of people made this comment, and I think it was pretty widely held. I mean, I think probably many of us, and this is very much a United States part of the discussion, many of us have been feeling for a long time that the federal government has been less and less a meaningful player in addressing all of the issues, whether it's issues of equity, issues of urban revival, issues of regionalism, issues of economic opportunity, and so forth. And I think, but in the conversations these last few days, there was a different tone to it. Because until a few weeks ago, it was always, yes, the federal government is diminishing, but with always a note, but maybe that'll turn around. And I had the sense from an awful lot of comments that people have now said the federal government is no longer a player, is no longer some place we can look to, and that that may be a long-term reality. I hope that's not true. I hope the, the line that began in the 1930s with the Great Depression and the New Deal and has continued, albeit with its ups and downs, has not been broken. But I fear that perhaps it has, and I think that issue in turn has huge resonance in terms of the question of how we go about actually trying to put flesh on the bones of these propositions and make them a reality. John? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a uniquely American debate at the moment, but it's reflected um, subconsciously probably in every country about the value of what central government can do and whether what happens is just being done by market forces in any case and that you can't really change these. Um, one can learn from them and one can influence them, but what, what's going to happen to cities uh, around the world um, is going to go on happening. I'm certainly uh, conscious that um, you're entitled to have an inward-looking American conference, but today, you know, if you add up everything that can be built today, there's probably another city to arrive somewhere, <clears throat> in China or the Middle East, um, and I think um, trying to transfer some of these lessons to the places that have none of these issues in mind when they build the cities, their construction projects to build cities. Um, those of us that are working in China, it's, it's, it's a privilege to be invited to think about the city at the beginning for them, but then it's a construction program. There's, there's no question about equity and quality of life and all those sorts of issues. So that's another challenge in a way is to, is to think about the challenge of the urbanization of the planet and whether finally the planet's going to say no, thank you. So um, I think there's, a, there's another level of debate that we haven't really talked about uh, a lot, but uh, the urbanization of the world um, how that is coped with um, could be a good subject for uh, for the next event. Thank you, John. Final thoughts? Tony? Um, I, maybe I'd, I'd like to leave with just the, the broader sort of notion of civic capacity and then break that into champions and leadership. Um, part of what we, some of us folks touched on, I'm sure, in all of the sessions, is the importance of leadership and governance and so forth, but I think we ought to think um, and acknowledge really specifically that there is a capacity gap uh, across the stratas of, of, of leadership and that that must be paid uh, attention to if we're to achieve uh, some of the provocations that we put forward. Um, and I think that's at, at all levels. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Office of Mayors because I think they have an extraordinary uh, hand in shaping the cities that we live in today and in the future. Um, and everything flows from that in terms of the culture of governance. And, and how are we looking to more effectively build the help to build the capacity, particularly in post-industrial cities that are so resource constrained, so that they can be more effective at achieving some of the visions that were put forward? And also, who else is going, who are we going to co-opt to be our champions of this message? 
Who is our audience for the work that we're putting forward? Um, we, in the, the spectrum of what happens in cities, are a fairly small group of folks, and we know the gospel. Who else must we cultivate uh, to this knowledge and to this practice that we're talking about to help further the agenda of how we want to remake these cities to be more just? And so capacity building leadership I think is critical. Well, thank you, all three of you. Thank you very much. So you can go.